I'm going to ask a question, but I think I'm going to know the answer for most of you, probably all of you, hopefully all of you. I know it's. Uh, I know the answer for me. Would you like to be closer to God? <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Hopefully, everybody that's watching for vid by video answers that yes as well as everybody did here. Wait, you know what? You're in luck. <laughs> you know why? Because God wants the same thing for all of us. I know the fact that God has said, I'll always be with you. I will never forsake you. So when I say or ask the question, do you want to be closer to God? What do I mean if he's already with us always? Well, I'm sure you know what, what that refers to. Just the experience of God's presence, power, uh, just his, his closeness is just a more real experience for us than maybe we tend to experience every day. Now, I'm not going to start saying you got to run around here and you got to raise your hands and you got to, you know, do all kinds of, of weird, weird stuff that you might say is, well, that's off the chart for me. I'm not going to say that. But I am going to say that Lent is a time for us to do that very thing, for us to really pay attention, to seek what's going on in my life, in my mind, in my heart that is keeping God, the experience of God's presence at a, at a somewhat of a distance. What am I doing? What am I not doing? That tends to, again, keep him at a feeling or experientially at a distance. Lent is a time for us to earnestly, incredibly focused time on seeking God, listening for, well, that still small voice. What was it? Elijah went off to try to find God, try, try to get an experience, and he looked for him in the whirlwind, looked for him in the fire. He wasn't there, but it was in that, that still small voice. There's a way the King James uh, phrases it, like a, like a soft whisper is like is way the English Standard Version translates that. That's when he encountered God. What was it that he, that he needed to do was to just slow down, slow down and not look for him in the ways that we have become maybe accustomed to it. Not that Elijah was accustomed to seeing him in the whirlwind or experiencing him in the fire, but just slow down. Don't let the, the pace of life control us and listen, listen. And in that listening, we realize we need to change our lives here, there, wherever, and it all becomes not only for His glory, but for maybe an establishing of some new habits in us. People tell us, um, science tells us, I've heard it numerous times over my, my career, that you have to do something, whatever it is that you want to cultivate in it as a change in your life, whether it's to do something or to stop doing something, you have to do it every day, without fail, not missing one day for a minimum of 28 days. I don't know if that's true. I've never really tried it, to be honest with you. <laughs> well, maybe this is a year for to try it for something, maybe for you. And if you miss a day, well, you got to start all over again. you got to start all over. You know, in a way, Lent is designed to help bring some of, the, some of, that, some of that around. Establishing new habits and, yes, a new level of experiencing a closeness of God. My mind goes back to that, uh, that little event in, in the, uh, um, the, the Truth Project. If you've never seen that, you, again, I'm gonna, I'll, put, I'll hold it up. You need to do the Truth Project. Yeah, it takes 13 weeks. Yeah, it takes a couple hours at a time, but it's, it's worth every moment of it, at least in my opinion. And there's one point in there that Del Tackett says something along the lines, this is a loose paraphrase, if we understood what happens in prayer, what God wants from us when we come, when we pray, we would never leave prayer. It's like God says, it's, come on, let's talk. let's talk. And if we have a level of that closeness in prayer, then we would never want to leave. I bet there's a lot of truth in that, a lot of truth. Lent could be a time, a significant time of being alone with God. We did a course many years ago in, the pre, in our previous uh, uh, situation uh, it was a course called Why Not Waste Time with God? Is it, is it a waste of time if we're ever just sitting there and talking with God, seeking His face, 
seeking his words, hearing from him, it never is a waste, never is a waste. I come to that theme because of our gospel reading today. Mark's gospel has the the wilderness experience, but he has the shortest, or he, has, he has, well, he has one of the shortest, and it talks. We we hit on a sequence here. I want to point out some things about this sequence, and I'm going to go a little bit further than where our, our reading took us, because next week our reading takes us all the way to Mark chapter eight, and so I want to just point out a, a couple of things. Number one, it started with his baptism. His baptism. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't use that phrasing in Mark's edition of, of uh, this uh, being baptized, but in Luke's uh, version, chapter 4, verse 1, it does says he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And you're baptized. You know, when you were baptized, you were filled. Now, the Scripture does speak about other times when we could get refilled. We should get refilled because as one person, at least a number of people have said, we're leaky vessels. We leak. And not only do we leak out the Holy Spirit, but we allow to leak in some of the impurities of life and the world. And so we need to be refilled. We need to be refilled. That's what Paul writes about in Ephesians. You know, when he says, be filled with the Holy Spirit, he's talking, writing to the, the, the church in Ephesus, and he knows that uh, how that, that needs to rehappen. But in our baptism, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. That was the first thing that Mark points to, his baptism. Then he moves very quickly to 40 days in the wilderness. Whew, what do you think Jesus did? We know he fasted for 40 days. What else do you think he did? He prayed. There's no question in my mind for a second that he wasn't praying pretty much every day. I mean, especially when Satan, we're only given three instances of how Satan uh, tempted him, uh, and it's not even listed here. It just said, and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. We're not told how many of the other Gospels talk about three specific ones, but I'm not of the opinion it was limited to three at all. I bet it was just about every day, maybe multiple times every day. How many times do we get hit with temptations? I don't know what your experience. Anybody want to share? Any, any takers? I don't know why I, I never get takers on those kind of, I don't know what, 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 what's wrong. Anyway, tempta we, we get hit with temptations multiple times a day, I'm sure. I'm sure. But he was 40 days in the wilderness, and, and I'm absolutely convinced he was praying a lot, a lot. And then after that, now... And he was with it. That verse 13 continues as after it talks about being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. But then it goes in the very next thing talk, Mark records. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. He immediately starts to, in a sense, I'll say, obey God's directives. He started his, his ministry. I can say that because if I jump ahead just for a moment to the, uh, chapter 1 and verse 37, this is when Jesus had gone out and prayed all night. I remember uh, Peter or Simon, and he hadn't been named Peter yet, Simon and the others came looking for him and they found him and said to him, everyone's looking for you. And verse 38 says, that he, that is Jesus, said to them, let us go on to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. That's part of the directive that he got from his father, especially if he hadn't already received it before the wilderness. He received it certainly during the wilderness. But our passage today ended with this quote from Jesus, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. What does it mean to repent and believe in the gospel? What does that mean? I bet everybody here could answer that question one way or another, but I, I, I'm of the opinion that what happened next was Jesus' understanding and Jesus beginning to teach, well, Simon and Andrew, James and John, to teach them this is what it means. And we see that the very next thing is, is that, that he called his disciples. 
going on from the end of our passage. It reads, Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. I think the very first thing is that we call people to Christ. We call people to Christ. When was the last time you asked somebody, what's your relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you have one? What's your relationship with God? We heard Bishop Peter stand over here, what was that, two weeks ago, and say, have you asked us about inviting people to church? It's one way to get into the conversation, but it's a little bit around the, the, the kind of the corner to get to it, but it's still trying to get to it. You know, we see the world basically going to hell in a handbasket, as they say. We had a, had a great presentation by Savannah today at Adult Ed about conspiracy theories, and, but, but how some of the, the way they get us sucked in and, and embracing a worldview that is not biblical. Anyhow, not every conspiracy theory thumbs on the... But at any rate, but I think the church, the church needs to renew this, get renewed in this. What does it mean to repent and believe in the gospel? Well, we call people, we call people to faith in Jesus. But then after that, after he called them, he got them, he showed them some things. And we see a, a bit of a pattern here. Chapter 1 continues where he heals a man with an unclean spirit. Reading quickly, so picking up with verse 21, they went into Capernaum and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. Do we teach? Do we teach? Repent and believe the gospel, call people to Jesus, and then be a teacher. If somebody said, no, I don't know anything about Jesus, where would you start to teach them? Do you have an idea? Do you have a plan? Do you have, have you thought about, how can I do this? Well, come to church and let it, uh, Andy will do it. No, if, no, no, I mean, I'll do my best. <laughs> I'll help, but I'll help you as well. I mean, that's what I hope that I'm doing to a certain degree every Sunday when I'm up here talking, is to, to help you do that. He goes on, so he was teaching. He had to give them some new information, some changing their worldview, if you will. He goes on, and they were astonished at his teaching. Not that anybody necessarily is going to be astonished at our teaching, but maybe, maybe. Oh, I've never heard this before. You know, I still remember... Uh, a lady many years ago, at, again, back at our previous place, uh, and I took her through the inquirer's course, and at the end of it, she said, I've been a member of this group, meaning this denomination, for f over 50 years. I've never heard that. I've never heard that. I thought, what are we doing? What are we doing? They were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed. So that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. He brought healing. You know, that's what our teaching, our teaching will bring healing. It may not be as, as uh, cataclysmic as this one, but it may be. It could be. It could be. Because we're changing the worldview. We're changing people's minds about how they think. What is it? The Old Testament says, as a man thinketh, so is he. So we have to change the way they think. Paul writes in one of his epistles, we persuade people. Are we aware, are we knowledgeable enough of the gospel that maybe we could persuade people? Well, what a, when they come back with us with questions, well, what about this and what about that and what about this? 
And don't be scared of not being able to, to share answers for that because every one of us, myself included, bishops included, everybody can get stumped with a question that they don't have an answer to. But they say, I'll get, that's a good question. I can't have an answer right now, but let me get back to you. That's how, to, that's how you, you handle those things. So he called people, he taught, and he healed. And the teaching is what really kind of does the healing and being led by the Holy Spirit. And then we come back to the item of prayer once again. Verse 35, a little bit further, skipping on down. And rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And that's when we get the where Simon and those who were with him searched for him and found him and said, everybody's looking for you. He says, no, let's go on to another town and preach there because that's why I'm sad. That's why... I was, I was sent. You know, Lent can be one of, and, and I think many times if we take Lent very seriously and carve out time and put things that are less important aside and spend time in prayer can be one of the most profound times of experiencing God's power and presence of any time during the liturgical year, maybe sometimes even for our whole life. It's very possible to be that way if we, if we take the time, if we make changes. Remember, when Simon and Andrew and James and John were called, what did they have to do? They left everything. They left everything. We may not be called to leave everything, but could we possibly be called to stay off the internet for a couple hours a day? Maybe turn the TV off for a couple of hours a day? Maybe do something else? that we don't normally do in order to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, be in prayer, be in prayer, maybe learn a little bit more about prayer. Luke chapter 13 records how the disciples asked Jesus, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray. And that's where we get the Luke inversion of the Lord's prayer. Now there's more to prayer than just the Lord's prayer. And that's one thing that we're going to concentrate on a little bit in, in our Lenten program on Wednesday nights about prayer, about prayer. I hope you'll come. There's a, we're having dinner at 5.30, and then we'll have the program start at 6. You can come for dinner and leave. I hope you don't, <laughs> but you could do that if you want. If you want to come for the program, skip the dinner, you can do that too. Um, but prayer, there is a sign-up sheet back there. We're still looking for people to sign up for the dinner, so we have a number, but still prayer. Lent can be one of the most profound times of prayer, of seeking God. And I hope it is not only for this congregation, but I hope it is really for the church worldwide. Remember, Jesus began his minute before he did any of his public ministry. He was in the wilderness. 40 days. Can we, in a sense, maybe go into what we might feel is a type of wilderness experience on purpose? And it's interesting that actually Mark describes you know, going into the wilderness. It says the Spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness. The other Gospels speak about the Spirit leading him. He had to agree. He had to choose to go out that way. Maybe could we enter into a, some level of a wilderness experience, even if it may be that way, it may not be. Again, our closeness to Jesus, our closeness to God may be so profound, we may experience the, the richest possible experiences uh, that we may have ever had. But it all, it all began with prayer, Jesus in the wilderness. And yeah, I guarantee you, if you try to do this in Lent, Satan's going to show up. He's going to say, this is stupid. He's going to say, this doesn't work for you. Not for you. It might work for Jesus. It's not going to work for you. Satan's going to show up. Remember what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. What is he saying? He's saying every temptation that comes on you it's been experienced for all of human history. There's nothing that we've experienced or could experience that even Jesus didn't experience. 
if not in the temptation in the wilderness, but certainly different places. Certainly when he was facing the imminency of the cross, Satan was right there whispering. It's one of the, I love the, well, I shouldn't say I love it, but the depiction in the Passion of the Christ movie of Satan in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus is praying. That could happen to us, something along those lines. Be ready for it. No temptation has seized you except that which is common to man, but God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear that you may stand up under it. That is an incredible, incredible, so the third time, incredible promise. If we choose to believe it and walk the way take the action that God has revealed to us when that temptation shows up. And then, well, again, the distance between heaven and our experience gets real close. Gets real close. At least it certainly can. Our Lenten program is titled When God's People Pray. So I hope you'll come. But I hope, regardless if you do or not, You'll make Lent, this Lent, this Lent, a time of seeking God, maybe perhaps as you never have before, but maybe it'll be the same, but, but it'll be just with renewed vigor, renewed emphasis, renewed focus, renewed commitment to be drawn closer to Him, as I said earlier, all for His glory, for the building up of the church and for the expansion of his kingdom all across the globe. Father God, we thank you for times like Lent. We tend to come to these times maybe with a bit of hesitation, but Father, I pray that everybody who's listening to my voice now or later through the video, we would come with a great level of anticipation and excitement about being drawn closer to you, being filled more fully, if that's possible, with your presence pushing out the things that distract us, pushing out the things that we, we succumb to in the way of temptations far too often. We thank you for your grace and mercy that it's not by our obedience that we earn your love, but it's by our obedience that we show our proper response to your love, proper respect to you, Lord Christ. And so, yes, even as Carol asked us to pray for those groups that she serves uh, the Blessing Others initiative sh serves on Friday night, that, that your spirit would fall on them as your spirit fell on Jesus prior to his temptation in the wilderness. Your spirit would fall in the fullness on them. They'd suddenly realize they're different. I'm different. What happened? And they start to look around and they start to think and they find out it was you. They're drawn to you. And I pray that's true for every one of us, not only here today, but again, watching by video. Take our lives and let them be consecrated, Lord, to thee, that you would be manifest, and glorified, and honored, and exalted in everything we say and do and are. For it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.